if anybody's out there watching this, if they want to think about getting into home brewing, trying to over plan too much, just try it, make a beer, you know, and the recipes are all out there. The ingredients are all way better than they were, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. And, um, and go to your local home brew shop. There's a lot, a lot of them, you know, Anik at Bulager gives you good information to get you started. Uh, so it's, it's there, yeah. it's, a, mm -hmm. it's doable. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to All Beer Inside. Uh, we are out and about again for interviews uh, because COVID numbers are really low and uh, we're vaccinated. So today I'm interviewing our first home brewers. Joining me is Dan and Drew. Thank you, thank Thanks. you for having us. Thank you very much for hosting us. I really appreciate you guys taking time in your schedule to speak with us today about your passion of home brewing. Yeah, so. Awesome. Uh, you brought me out some delicious looking beers to try. What's the first one I'm going to be trying here? The first one is a, is a Pilsner brewed in ale temperatures with a Kvike yeast uh, called Lutra. And uh, it's the, uh, for the home brewer, it's a, it's a marvelous yeast that allows us to brew Pilsner or lager type beers without having to go through the, the, lager, the lagering process. So that is, uh, is uh, we've been, I've been brewing that for probably a past year and a half. And it seems to be a hit because uh, it doesn't last long. <laughs> That's good. So, uh, as we do, a virtual, uh, well, not a virtual, an actual an toast. Actual toast. toast. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Cheers toast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow, super crushable. Like, just that faint hit of Pilsner business. It's, wow. I can see why it, like, it goes. Yeah, it goes quick. I mean, my son loves it, and his friends come over, and they, uh, they went and played a round of golf yesterday at the uh, UFO and I think they got here around two in the morning because I saw some glasses in the sink there. So they were definitely crushing a few after their yeah. golf game. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so Dan, Drew, what got you guys into home brewing? What's the beer story? We'll start with wow. you because... Yeah, I, I, um, I got started probably early 80s, mid 80s, because my parents were home brewers um, before I even thought of home brewing. And, um, didn't really take an interest in the actual brewing itself, just more of the consuming, consumption <laughs> part. And one day I actually uh, had a ball game, invited a few guys over for beers, and we started tucking into the homebrew stash. And I don't know how many we finished off, it might have been 15 or 20 quarts, but it was all gone. <laughs> so next day, my, uh, my dad comes up to me, hey, uh, son, uh, Where's the homebrew? I said, well, <laughs> there's some empty quarts over there. They're gone. He goes, okay, next batch, you're going to help me. No problem, Dad. So I was responsible for crushing grains. It was all grain brewing back then. Just, to, you know, my parents were more inspired by the some of the imports like bass, double diamond, and all that type of stuff. And uh, they just got into it uh, from a friend as well. So that was kind of the beginning. of. Very cool. Dan, yourself? So I got involved, uh, so the, how it all started is um, we, we were introduced to craft beer. Some friends came over and brought some lugs, uh, some Bose lug tread. And uh, <clears throat> we enjoyed that because we had already wore off of drinking beer. We were into the wine scene because, you know, we were fed up of the, 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 the local, not the local, but the, the, the commercial mm -hmm. beers. And w they would taste it all the same and we got fed up of that. So we've tasted these, we liked them. And then uh, shortly thereafter, I'm um, reading the local newspaper and uh, there's a brewery in the West Island that's open. So we decide, well, let's go give that a try because, uh, you know, Friday nights, so I used to like, we go out with my wife and we'd go and have a couple of beer or dinner or something. And then uh, we just got into the Labrosse thing and they were making craft beer and, you know, we really enjoyed their beer and, the, and they had a great ambiance over there. It was a nice place to hang. And then after that, uh, you know, I'm hearing all, all the people talking about IBUs and ABV and hops and dry hopping and I'm trying, what are these people talking about? So for that year for Christmas, my wife brought, bought me a home brewers course at uh, Bootleggers. Okay. And it was Anik that gave the course. And I went to say, look, I'm just trying to understand how to brew these beers and look where I am today. <laughs> Nine yeah. taps in the basement. <laughs> so, but anyways, uh, then, uh, you know, I, I drew success to me. He says, well, 
why don't you come to my place and brew with me and uh, you know maybe uh, you can get started that way and uh, I wasn't interested in making home brew from a bag like mm -hmm. uh, buying DME uh, dry malt extract or LME uh, and then just pouring water throwing your yeast and being done with it because I got away from drinking not yeah. good beer I wasn't gonna make not good beer. yeah yeah for sure <laughs> So that's how it all got started. And then I brewed uh, six batches with Drew at, at his place, which were all IPAs. And then that's how it all got started. And then uh, with Drew's, we, at Drew's place, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little like mechanical myself. So I saw some places where we could improve, you know, not necessarily process, but how we were doing things to make things safer to yeah. so I built a we built a rack to brew on with the, everything was gravity fed and all that good stuff and that's how it all started we started like that what are more or less some of the difficult like we all know cleaning is very difficult tedious part of home <coughs> brewing but what are some other kind of difficulties that you guys run into that really sometimes you question what you're doing the cleaning part is definitely is definitely highly important because you can lose a batch of beer just because you're not clean or not sanitary. And cleaning and sanitization are two different things. Cleaning is one thing, then you have to sanitize. And that, that's one of the things. But I think the, mo the hardest part is, uh, is uh, hitting the numbers in your recipe, your efficiency numbers. So, you know, you're shooting for a 7% uh, ABV beer and you might have overshot your mash temperature. So next thing you know, your beer comes in a little under or it comes in sweeter. So managing your mash temperature is probably our biggest yeah, defeat, I, I right? think generally, and I think most home brewers would agree, is temperature control through yeah. the whole process is kind of hit and miss because we kind of all go and get a glycol chiller once we're <laughs> fermenting or, you know, trying to hit our mash temp, you know, during mashing can be challenging if you don't have a pump and some kind of way to maintain your temp. But uh, um, that's, you know, if you're getting into the process, that's kind of the, the bit of a challenge. But fortunately, and we just talked about before, the beer you're just drinking, Lutra, or the Kvaik yeast, it kind of gives you that flexibility. Well, it's 95 degrees outside. Let's ferment at 80, 85 Fahrenheit, and we'll have a beer in a week, you know? So there's the ingredients and the all the all the new stuff that comes out actually makes it easier to brew and kind of helps hide maybe some of your uh, your inefficiencies you might have in your system. I am starting to see like product, you know, more ingredients, more things coming available to the market. So that must you guys must love that that you know just constantly experiment uh, new hop varieties and going from there it's it's a lot of fun it yeah. must be great so yeah. Yeah, yeah we like to chase down sorry for interrupting but we yeah, like no. to chase down you know like if a new grain comes out like drew got this new grain called red x it's not new but it's new to us in this area and uh drew was able to to get some and he brewed a red beer with it and he turned out to be really good so that avoided us from having to use caramel malts uh, yeah, and from, all these ideas come from other places right so yeah. you go on the internet you can find i'll mention these guys i don't I'm not plugging them or anything, but Gina's <laughs> Brewing out in uh, Spokane, Washington. They have a g great podcast that they do, and they talk about recipe development, things like that. Just one one place we go to also, there was uh, Sapwood Cellars a few years ago that I actually got down there to meet Mike Tonsmeyer, for example, and talk about beer. You know, my wife thought I was uh, shell, you know, <laughs> starstruck and all that. But yeah, so I geeked out with him a bit about beer and you know, as best I could. And uh, you just pick stuff up, you know, and it's a lot. What's cool about a lot of the breweries and the brewers out there is they're open. They, just, you know, oh, you're home brewer. Yeah, you can talk for hours, you know. Yeah. It's really cool that way. Yeah, I mean, it even shows uh, Troy and that bus doing a home brewer series now. Yeah, it's, uh, there you go. Th the breweries recognize that you guys are kind of the backbone of, of their industry yep. in a sense. Yeah. So going and throwing your ideas at the wall, see what sticks, it's it's awesome. And I know, Dan, you've worked with Dan from and Troy from La Bras as well. Yeah. Well, we've bounced ideas off of each other, you know. Uh, we've done things like, uh, you know, Dan will come here and taste some of our beers. And not saying that he takes anything from here, it's far from it. He's his own man, his own brewery, does his own thing. But he does come here and find things that are intriguing of things that we've tried that may have failed, may have passed, may be mediocre. Uh, so that you know he has that advantage of, of, of having that and I, I'm wide open with my recipe book with him I show him everything and uh, you know those guys are pretty good to work with on that perspective um, you mentioned the homebrew contest we actually won that oh. uh, in the IPA with our uh, what the haze bro <laughs> we 
Dan and I'm it. brewing yeah. it there with them next Friday. So. Yeah, because I just saw he was releasing. I think it's a Pilsner as the first yeah, Eric, generation Eric of that. Yeah, Eric Perry's Pilsner. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna go there this afternoon. I want to give it a whirl. I want to go see his Pilsner. I'm I was yeah, wondering that. what to do this afternoon. <laughs> I I do love that I that idea of of them allowing it, and even you know larger not larger but you know the microbreweries having people like us come in and doing a collab beer or doing a collab beer with an influencer i don't know if you've seen right. the series uh she's called that petite bière and mm. she made a new england ipa with overhop out of uh saint jean sur richelieu mm-hmm. right and then there's he's called box and hops matt and he did a full series where it's a heavy metal band goes to a brewery and they brew a beer and it's called the North American Brutal series. And I think it's like 25, 30 beers from North America with a heavy metal band making a beer. So, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you saying brewers just, yeah, you're a home brewer. Cool. Come in. Let's, yeah. let's do some stuff. So yeah. as a show, we've learned pretty much everybody in the beer industry is awesome. So uh, that fact that you opened up time for us today to speak with you is just proves our point once again. So, and yeah. at the end of the day, this is why we're doing this. It's sort of we're on camera here today, but even if you guys came over, hey, let's have a beer, just yeah. talk about whatever beer, pol- well, maybe yeah. not politics yeah. and other things, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's the uh, that's what beer is it's a yeah. social yeah. drink, and you get together with family, friends, and you enjoy it. That's kind of how Dan and I look at it is oh, we have stuff to offer if people come over, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, that's that's you hit the nail yeah. on the head there. That's the thing. You don't you don't make beer. We don't compete with each other to make beer. We don't compete with anybody. We make beer so that here, try this. This is what I made. You know, what do you think? You know, and and we have our own opinions of what our beer is, and you know, we try to we try to make sure that we don't always uh, you know mold to one thing, right? We yeah. want to make sure that we have different. Unless we get demands, right? Yeah. yeah well, that happens. My house is <laughs> it's. New England style hazy or nothing, you know. Actually, I've had to branch out into the uh, the ciders a little bit, thanks to Dan actually, because he's he sort of trailblazed that for me and uh, just offering different things like that. But uh, it's, it's yeah, that's uh, that's one thing that kicked us in the pants with the pandemic is we would get together on a monthly basis. Everybody would bring a beer or two. We'd do mm-hmm. a beer tasting and we'd record it and give our uh, as they call them, consumer palate opinions, because we're very basic. We're not like, oh, this hop was grown in this valley. And I'm just like, mm, juicy, tasty. So, <laughs> yeah, we're we're there. We're where you are. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of juicy and tasty, what's beer number two? I'm going to be trying here. So that is a session IPA, New England style, uh, 4.73%, uh, 39 IBU. It's a, it's a, it's a. It was intended to be a quick drinking summer beer. Um, was aiming for a bit of a because session IPAs tend to have a very light body or very watery uh, beer so I've tried to make this one a little thicker and you know through adding oats and uh, golden naked oats and stuff like that so yeah it's 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 a nice session IPA that I think beautiful nose yeah that's the thing the lighter the beer you know for example I'm not saying it's easy to make an eight percent New England style IPA, but the challenge is saying, okay, I, I can't keep drinking these eight percenters. I want to come in around five if I can, five and a half, and still have that aroma, flavor, and mouthfeel you're looking for. And there, it's you know, there's things we can we've experimented <laughs> yeah. with, thanks to you know some of the guys we talked to in the industry, of course, you know, using different ingredients to try and thicken it up a little bit. But this one's really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is light, uh, crushable. Uh, for a new for New England, you know, it's it's not overly oh, yeah. bitter, it's not overly hopped to me. It's got so, a nice firm bitterness yeah. though. I like though. It's yeah. but it's not overpowering mm-hmm. at all. Yeah, that's it's, the it's cascade really and the Columbus in the yeah. what I in the early stages. Well, of the whirlpool, there's zero boil hops in this. And it's all in the whirlpool and dry hop. Yeah, the, uh... it's, it's like dancing on the side of my tongues, which I like of of my yeah. session sessionable beers. Is I get that side taste. So. I could ask Dan, was that with the uh, homegrown Centennial? In that one? Uh, no, not okay. this one. The other two had Centennial in it. Yeah. From the vine that, as you can see, there's hops here. Yeah. We have a hop as, vine in the back, as, and I. Uh, exactly. So that's, you know, you're true to form when you're saying it's a home brewing. Is I'm even growing my own hops in the backyard. <laughs> so Dan's <laughs> taking it to another level here. <laughs> but it's it's a beautiful plant. If you ever Soon want a plant to, to hide a fence or anything, <laughs> these buggers will grow 12 inches to 16 inches a day on a hot, humid day. 
And if you don't believe me, go outside. I mean, these plants were sticking out of the ground that far, and now they're 16 feet up and doubled back yeah. down another 16. So, yeah. for, for sure, we'll have images of that because I, I love that kind of stuff. What was the first beer you ever brewed? First beer I brewed with Drew together at his. Uh, no, it was here, and we called it. Oh yeah. Something Thunder. It was a New England IPA. I think it was and the. Uh, uh, was, uh, actually, Dan, I remember that day because it was. Uh, oh no. The Massif was the first one we oh, at my together place. at your place. Yeah. May 27th, 2018. Right. And then the first one we brewed here after we brewed over there was uh, Golden Sunshine. Yeah, October I think it was something 2018. called Stormy Dan's, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> but I have these in, uh, anyways, we have a. Uh, but we've played, I've played a lot. Like at first, I started, you know, brewing beers just using the water of obviously filtered from the tap. Yeah. Uh, with a charcoal filtration system and then you know then we started treating our water with water so with brewing salts and you know from stuff we'd learned through mm -hmm. you know talking with Dan at Labrosse and seeing you know we've got I've got uh, Janish's book there and seeing what they recommend for certain types of beer and uh, yeah, yeah there was a we um, you know we evolved off of our first brews quite a bit and uh, you know, we, we yeah. like I mentioned earlier, we I did not want to brew beer from a bag or from a... Mm -hmm. I wanted to go all grain from the onset, and Drew was doing all grain, so that's where I absorbed the, 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 the training from Drew, because he was already doing all grain. So I skipped that whole step of... Which makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah I went through the whole evolution of, you know, the Festa brew, throw it in a pail and throw your yeast at it, you have beer, you know, and then... I probably started in 2015 or 14 when I, on my third stint brewing at home. And then I got onto the, you know, five gallon batch on the stove top. It didn't take long before my family said, get out of my kitchen on a Sunday morning. I want to make bacon and eggs. So I eventually migrated everything to the, to the garage. And that's made a lot easier. Yeah. Well, speaking with Keegan from Four Origins, he's like, yeah, literally I would be on the stove and then I'd stick it in my closet. <laughs> just yeah. let it ferment there and, yeah and they've gone from there i mean they're four origins now they're up there as one of the more popular breweries in montreal oh, yeah. it's yeah. Uh, i love the concept of old industrial like them and masorum so it's uh, that's yeah, something they're I cool love too. cool places that's yeah. for sure there's yeah. so many um you know people with converting old garages into breweries and oh it's summertime let's crack open that garage door mm -hmm. and open it to everything so the mm -hmm. the creativity from home brewing to influencers to uh, breweries now when it comes to micro or craft is just mind blowing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, I think we've had four open in Quebec during the pandemic. So yeah, right. it's, yeah. it's impressive that yeah. they were actually able to, 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 to support their business plan mm -hmm. because you know, that's the biggest part of opening a brewery is the initial investment you have to make and the months you go revenueless because of the fact that you've got to improve your leasehold, you've got to put the plumbing in, you've got to put the refrigeration in, you've got to put all that stuff in and buy your brewing equipment and then start all that up. You're six months before you pour your first beer. And to survive that six months plus more in yes. COVID is truly impressive and creative on their part. How they did it, hats off to those people, really. So the naming of your beers is pretty creative too. Where do, where do you come up with that? Naming of the beers is a cross between the hops that are used, the style it is. So, for example, if the Pilsner, so we call it Pilsner because I live on Pilsner Street in Kirkland, and uh, that's why we call it Pilsner because it just goes faster than we can make it. Um, the red is a recipe that Drew gave me a while back. Uh, that when I first started that he had brewed, it's a Zanachev, yeah, Jamil, Jamil Zanachev yeah. recipe that was called a Red Devil or what was it called? Man, I forget what it was, but um, yeah, it's kind of a... Oh, the, Evil Twin. Evil Twin, yeah. It was called the Evil Twin. His brewery, I think, I think you know, he's, uh, his brewery's called Heretic, I believe. And yeah, he just, old time brewer and uh, he... He wouldn't want me to say that, probably the same age, but um, <laughs> yeah, it was a nice little recipe when I saw it, you know, it's uh, it's a red or a, um, yeah, a red with uh, U.S., you know, Centennial, uh, I believe, Columbus, sort of like a West Coast style red and very good. And he had a really good um, 
malt bill that really made it, yeah. you know, not just really easy to drink, complement the hops and everything else. So good little recipe. But speaking of names, I mean, sometimes it, you just blurt out the name. So for example, uh, we started using uh, first ordered strata hops, you know, oh, I gotta get some of that. So I ordered it, bring it in, make a, make a beer. You, you use probably, you know, a little too much of it because now people say, yeah, you may want to complement it with something else. But anyway, when I first poured one out of the tap, I could smell the pot. I could smell cannabis coming out of there. And I said, whoa, that's a dank bastard. So that's what I called it. Not original, but that's what that's what it is. I don't know yeah. if you have to edit that out, but that was no, kind of no, sort good. of the first reaction when you drink it. Oh, that's dank. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah. When it comes to creativity part, is there any homemade brewing equipment that you guys have made? Dan, start with that. Yeah, we, we yeah. make all, we, we try to improve on our processes and and our temperature control is very important. So we try to improve on, on those aspects. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of things that we've made, like, uh, you know, like these kegerators. I mean, basically we've done our own kegerators. And if you look inside later, if it, you'll see that the, you know, the, 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 the uh, CO2 manifolds in there right. and everything's in there. And we have 10 feet of line in there to make sure to minimize the foaming and stuff like that. Um, what you don't see is that I brew my beer in the garage, which is about uh, about 65 feet away from where I ferment. So um, um, Greg at Bootlegger uh, mentioned something. Well, I have a friend that, uh, you know, he doesn't carry because Drew carries his, his carboys downstairs. So when I start, first started drawing, brewing with included. Drew, I says, we got to stop carrying this beer down the stairs. It's ridiculous because if we break it, not only we lose our batch, it's the mess we got to yeah, clean up yeah. after. You know, that's worse than losing your batch because you always go to the store and buy beer, right? Keep in mind, I, I have the same setup, but I, I think what happens is at the end of the day, you're chilling down and you, you're just like, oh. then it's another step to clean out a hose and it's out of laziness, basically. I say, you know what? I'm just going to pick this thing up. I'm going to truck it downstairs yeah. myself and it, you know, no accidents yet, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I think at some point I'm going to have to uh, say So, uh, So what I've right built way. is I have a hose that I transfer the beer from the garage right into the fermentation room okay. that I don't yeah. have to carry the beer yeah. downstairs. It flows natural gravity, no pump, and it flows right into the fermenter. So that's one of the things that, that we've made. Um, I've converted all of my system over to electrical. We were uh, with uh, natural, the natural gas yeah. or the propane bottles, whatever. Um, that is, uh, is great in the summertime. In the wintertime, it's obviously a challenge because you have to leave the garage door open to brew. Yeah. And then you're fighting, you're dropping temperature on your mash and you're, you're, you're fighting you know, the, the steam and all that stuff. So it becomes quite complicated. Yeah. So we make stuff like that. Uh, other thing I made that we'll, I might show it to you later is a, is a gadget to dry hop with so that we don't have to open our fermenters. We can, we got like a, I made a little chamber where we can pressurize it with CO2, put the hop, well, put the hops in, pressurize it with CO2, and then put it on top of the fermenter and then just it, with a quick connect with, a, with a, um, a TC clamp, which those in the brewing industry will know. A TC clamp, put it on top of the fermenter and just open the valve and let the CO2 push the hops down inside yeah. and close it. That way we don't have to open the cover of our fermenter for our New England IPAs to introduce the hops in the dry hop schedule. Because we pride ourselves on zero oxygen in our beer. We do everything we can in our power to not put beer oxygen. So it's once, a challenge. Yeah, and, and once the beer, uh, the, the wort flows into the fermenter, that's the last time it sees oxygen. We try to not let introduce any other oxygen in the beer. Um, after that point, uh, all our transfers are done closed. We pressurize our fermenters, push it into the kegs directly. Kegs are filled with sanitizer. They're purged back. That's what these buckets are here. They're purged. The sanitizer is used three times, and we purge it out of the keg back into a bucket, and then uh, we repurpose it. And that way we know that, they're, the, that the keg is oxygen-free. So those are things that we've done and, uh, you know, built different apparatuses out of wood to try and minimize the amount of movement that we have to do. From the sound of it, you went from like kind of, uh, we, we're enjoying craft beer to like, oh, all yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> yeah. It's, it was like uh, once we put our foot in the door, we sort of got sucked in by this big vortex, you know? <laughs> yeah. And even your home keg right, as you can tell, it's, you know just a fridge i don't know if you got them secondhand or whatever but it's like okay just stick the drill through mm -hmm. stick the piping through yeah. let's do yep. this so. if anybody's out there watching 
this if they want to think about getting into home brewing. Trying to over plan too much, just try it, make a beer, you know, and the recipes are all out there. The ingredients are all way better than they were, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. And, um, and go to your local home brew shop. There's a lot, a lot of them, you know, Anik at Bulager gives you good information to get you started. Uh, so it's, it's there, yeah. it's, a, it's doable. Yeah, and for forty dollars, the course—that's what it was when I took it three, four years ago. I mean, I don't know with COVID and everything and pricing, but uh, it's it's highly informative. You know, it engages you and uh, you know gives you just enough information to know. Oh, this is what an adjunct is, right? This is what a grain is. Oh, there's different kind of grains. Oh, I didn't know that, you know. And then they give us, they go through all of that liquid yeast, mm -hmm. uh, you know, dry yeast and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I did it because I was interested in starting at some point, and then I realized I don't personally have the room right now. Uh, but there was a guy there who's like, "Oh, I want to make a jalapeno beer, and I'm mashing in jalapeno." And she's like, "There's an easier way to do that." So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it, shout out to Anik, she's great. So yeah, when you mash, the problem when you mash uh, adjuncts like a jalapeno or fruit is that you tend to uh, remove most of the taste. Jalapeno, you won't. You'll get the heat, but you mm -hmm. won't get the taste. Yeah. Whereas if you do it in the dry hop or in the whirlpool, if you must, then you maintain some of that. But there's a danger in doing it in the whirlpool because if your fruit is not is not uh, pasteurized, yeah. you could contaminate your beer. So there's there's things to consider of what you're putting in. Well, that's uh, another thing with craft breweries now. It's like your beer has to stay cold. It can pasteurize after the can might explode. I'm like, if I'm in Toronto for the weekend, the last thing I need is exploded beer in the trunk of my car, driving on the 401, like I pulled over by the OPP. So, Smells like beer in here, yeah. son. I swear, officer, it's 6 a.m. I'm sober. I'm just trying to get back to Montreal. Like, you know, so. Uh, what's beer number three I'm going to be trying here? That is uh, a little dank. Uh, it's, uh, it's called the Zappa's Cosm uh, Cosmic Debris, which is uh, it's a, using the Zappa hop and Cosmic Debris. If any of you know Frank Zappa, it's one of his songs. So that's how I came up with the name. It's, it's, a, it's a very unique hop. It's got quite a punch in the mouth when you first take it, but it goes away quite smooth. Uh, after, yeah. but it's very unique. It's very, very unique hop. Uh, would I brew 15 beers with it? Probably not, but I'm happy I tried it. And uh, it is, it's, it's a dank, weedy tasting beer uh, for those that like that kind of beer. Um, I, I, I don't mind it. Uh, some people don't like it, which is yeah. fine. I mean, that's why I have nine taps. You're not gonna like everything that's on these nine taps. There's nine taps here for different people that ha try different beers. Some people don't like Pilsners and some people that's all they drink. Yeah. So yeah. you have, I have you have the ability to to give them whatever you know whatever type of beer they like. Uh, what are some of your favorite styles of beer to kind of stick to to repeat over and over and over? And just, this is what I prefer. Obviously, the Pilsner being as popular as it is. Is there anything beyond the Pilsner? Sticking with IPAs, things like that. Well, my yeah, my per personal preference is all is, is the IPAs of different types. We've tried. Uh, that's actually brewed with oat milk so that uh, you know I've tried different methods and ways of um, still playing with the way of how to introduce the oat milk whether I introduce it late in the boil mm -hmm. because the thing is if you I think if you introduce it that's my thought process I have no science to back it up but I'm thinking if I put the oat milk too early into the boil process well I'm going to boil away everything that I think I was putting into it so I put this in, in the last 30 minutes the next one I might do it in the, ne in the last 15 but it is a lot of extra work to do an oat milk because if you got you got to make your own oat milk because you can, yeah. you sh you can but you shouldn't use oat milk that you buy at the store yeah. because of all the preservatives that are in it. But it's very easy to make oat milk. It's like one cup of oats uh, to two cups of water and okay. just throw it in the blender at that puree and it comes out. And then you squeeze it through a, a bag and it, uh, and you use the milk. I'm sure you don't want to burn away those sugars at the same time, so it's really introducing it. At well, that that's it, and point, and so. there will still be residual sugars that will come out of it, that you don't know how mm. that's going to affect the outcome of your. So I'm still playing with it. Yeah. For... Well, it, like you're both saying, experimentation is kind of the main thing about this. It's you might end up with one bad batch, but as long as you end up with seven great batches, it yeah, exists, so. exactly, exactly. So you know, I mean, I've. Uh, like the thing is is i do a lot of like you know i have friends like that uh, that like the red beer so they come over and we'll brew it together and then we'll split 
the, 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 the output two or three ways, depending upon, <coughs> you know, who wants it. So yeah, we brew bigger batches. I, i I can brew three kegs at a time, 15 gallons in, in the keg, uh, quite easily now. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what that's, uh, so the favorite is the IPA, obviously the house favorite is probably the Pilsner because of, of my son and his friends, because my son's not into the IPAs at all. <laughs> So, uh, but for me, my wife and our friends yeah. are the, more of IPA hopheads. Over the years, I've <laughs> noticed a lot of people who, oh, I don't like beer. I don't like beer. Well, try this. Whether it's at a brewery or at home or whatever. Wow. Have another glass, you know. It, for some reason, that hazy fruit juice type beer seems to be um, introducing new, new beer drinkers, at least mm -hmm. in my household anyway, mm -hmm. you know. And I think it's a lot to do with, I mean, let's face it, uh, you know, over the years when all you could get was the, uh, you know, the 50s and whatnot, yeah. you know, I drank them when I was younger, but a lot of people, oh, I don't like that beer, you know, it just, they didn't enjoy it. And then you realize now, well, yeah, I can see why, because yeah. this is what could have been produced all these years anyway. But so it introduces new beer drinkers and. In my house, that's basically what moves the mo quickest. So I just turn those over whenever I can, you know, pretty often actually. Yeah, that's that's a question I tend to ask the breweries is somebody comes in and, eh, I don't like beer. What's that like gateway beer that you find? And, and most of them are, well, what's your palate like? What do you enjoy drinking? Do you like wine? Do you do, do this? Mm -hmm. Do you drink that? And, oh, try that. Oh, try that. Oh, try a sour. Mm -hmm. Like uh, where I work, uh, one of the one girls I work with, she's like, oh, I don't like beer. I'm like, okay, well, what do you like? She's like, oh, sour candies. I'm like, then try sour. Yeah. yeah. That's and the other one I, yeah. I was going to mention is the sours are, I just know it's people who haven't enjoyed beer in the past, IPA and sours with, with that fruit, good mm -hmm. fruit flavor base, I guess you could say. Nothing too, uh, um, you know, some of the sours I've had, I find them, wow, that's really sour. There's not much flavor except the sourness coming at you. But if, if, you, if it's balanced out with a nice fruit, flavor no at the nose or whatever mm -hmm. those seem to seem to be pretty popular that's for sure i know dan does i i haven't done a sour myself yet but dan keeps saying yeah we'll do one together yeah yeah we'll do it we'll, we'll do, do it we are gonna do one we're gonna do one we're gonna do one yeah well speaking of sour that's yep. the last beer i'm gonna be trying so that's uh what's this sour all about that's called cherry berry sour so basically it's cherries and blackberries and the only reason i added blackberries in it is because i wanted that deep ruby color because i couldn't get it the, the, it tends to be a little less rubyish with just bare cherries in mm -hmm. it so uh it's uh it's a cherry it's mild 3.4 ph of 3.4 nice and mild nice mm -hmm. and drinkable not uh, too tart on the on the on, you know not salad dressing like um <laughs> Well, this could be dangerous. This is way too smooth. Like, That's yeah, 4.8, yeah. uh, I believe, 4.86. Mm -hmm. It's a little and then than there's your a raspberry, sour. Uh, a raspberry guava sour that's more on the pink side. That's basically what I do when I make a sour batch. As I sour, I sour the, uh, the 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 beer, and then I ferment it, and then I add the fruit. So when I add the fruit, I split the batch. Well, I've already split it in half when I move it to the fermenter. And I'll put one kind of fruit in one and another mm -hmm. kind of fruit in another. So this time it was uh, so raspberry guava is just that everybody loves that one. So last time it was mango, mango passion fruit. This time it was cherry berry. This is fantastic. Uh, it's like you said, it's not overpower sour or tart. It's like that right level. The cherry is dancing on the palate. It's, it's mm. fantastic. This is uh, personally, this is my favorite one. Uh, I know a lot of people who would say Pilsner straight up and the session but for me this this is personally my favorite right now so. yeah and it, it's tough to make a, a a sour that laces a glass like that yeah you know usually usually How do you do that <laughs> <laughs> well i have no secrets basically it's this recipe soured okay with no hops obviously because yeah. you only have seven ibus so basically it's a session ipa recipe grain bill soured and it's actually fermented with ipa yeast yeah. which is escarpment very cool yeah so i asked this everyone and i've had to add this caveat obviously because there is still kind of a worldwide pandemic going on when it's safe to travel anywhere again for beer what is that beercation you want to go on realistic one or yeah. uh yeah oh so he, so yeah. here's another thing i was asking my uh the people i would influencers and stuff uh 
yes, I have to go back to work. And two, I won the Lotto Max. Goodbye job. Yeah. I'm going on a permanent <laughs> vacation. So. <laughs> I guess I, I would definitely would look to go to the uh, to Europe. You know, whether it's uh, um, Germany, Belgium. You know, try the uh, uh, what they have going there, which is I, I'm sure be all great. You know, the Belgian beers. Um, I've never used Brett before. Um, the only experience I had with that is my wife makes uh, sourdough bread. So I actually did a sort of a uh, St. Lazar wild <laughs> ale or whatever I called it. And um, it was a combination of the, uh, the yeast she used for, for sourdough. And I tossed a little bit of Nottingham in there just to make sure I was finishing it off. <laughs> and uh, came out this nice, clear. I did two of them. One, the first one was, was great. shockingly good. It was excellent. The second one kind of, who knows? I mean, every, everything changes on the string, whatever's being... Mm -hmm whatever the yeast want to do and throw off. Yeah. But it was, it was pretty good too. I might do one again this summer, I'll see. But uh, yeah, so just about trying different beers and going to different countries, probably head to Europe. Dan, yourself? Um, uh, the unrealistic... Uh, uh, <laughs> the the thing, Lotto Max. Yeah, the <laughs> Lotto Max one is I would love to do that same trip in Norway that the gentleman in the United States did. Chip Walton. Chip Walton, yeah, and brew a Kavik with uh, shrubs and yeast off of a stick. That's it. <laughs> yep. He used juniper. You yeah. should have seen him shoving the juniper in the kettle. I don't know if you saw it on, no. online. Oh, he, they, they, he, yeah, there, there's a gentleman that uh, did a vacation, and he went to this place, uh, this guy's yeah, place, where they brewed a beer in an old cauldron in a cave. Uh, yeah, I'd like to do that. Yes. I, I really like to try that. And it's just, all just quite from, yeast, you know, it's all going back a thousand years or whatever it is. Yeah. And it's incredible. Yeah. Anyway, it's on, the, uh, you know, it's all on YouTube. Yeah, ultimately, yeah, I'd love to, since I have the appearance, I look like a monk. So go and drink with monks. There you yeah. go. So it's the big open vat where the yeast is falling from the ceiling with <laughs> mm -hmm. the spiders and everything else that's been there for centuries I mean, upon centuries. So I... I think that's like one of the coolest things is it's gotta even be an experience. Full, full monk gear if I have to dress up and <laughs> swear away, you know, it, whatever for a while just to hang out and drink with monks. So yeah, that I, I'd... I think that'd be hilarious. Uh, it'd be great YouTube videos. <laughs> it would, sure. it sure would. <laughs> yeah. It sure would. And the more realistic side, I really want to get to where Drew went at uh, Sapwood Cellars. Uh, I think those people are inspirational. They, they, they do a lot of their own. I mean, there's there there are obviously some level of scientists in them. Uh, I mean, Janish, he sometimes you read his stuff or you listen to his stuff. I mean, he's he's extremely blatantly clear, but it's complicated some of the stuff he talks about. But he's he's really good. Like yeah, a lot of the stuff we do, uh, like you know, whirlpool hopping, the temperatures we whirlpool hop at. There are ideas that we've taken, that I have taken from them. I don't copy their stuff, obviously, but I do take inspiration from what they do. Uh, would you guys ever consider starting your own brewery? <laughs> it's. I would. You know what? It's sort of like a. Um, it is a, for for me anyway. It's a hobby. It's a way to say, uh, create something out of nothing type of thing, and then enjoy share it with family, friends, and whoever wants to. You know, my neighbor comes over. We're have a beer in the garage and shoot the breeze or whatever. Um, thought about it. I think a couple of years ago we were kind of, eh, it'd be kind of cool. But then you realize it, it's, it's a business and it's, it's a tough one. You know, there's, there's a lot, a lot of brewers out there, a lot of breweries out there. Um, it's a real commitment. Um, but I would say uh, I would not consider opening one. I just enjoy the, the hobby and going to places uh, like we talked about. We can go anywhere nearby and enjoy beer. You know, um, so my answer is sort of no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, however, you... it would be it would be fun, but yeah. then the reality of the business I think kicks in, and this is from talking to some of the you know, it, it's a battle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a it's a business. You got to deal with a lot of different things. That I'm sure you've, you know, I believe you've yeah. had a, a couple of the brewers on, uh, owners on, and it's it's a challenge. I mean, just the initial investment alone, just buying fermenters and buying mm -hmm. the equipment, mm -hmm. and finding the location, and like you said, six months before you can really open, it's it's yeah. a lot. I mean, unless you're truly committed, to, to me, it's 68 hour work weeks, and it's yeah. it's insanity. To me, it has to extend from a hobby. You, you almost have to treat it like it's. I'm not here to make money, even though I like to. It's got to extend. 
as a hobby as opposed to oh man we gotta yeah as long we gotta as make some a, money here to pay this off it it becomes a uh, it, it can be tough you know for, for as long as it pays for itself yeah. in the long run it's i think is what's important it could be a long run though <laughs> the problem is is uh you know the the, the tastier the beers yeah. get the hoppier they get the more hops you put in the more dollars you spend on a, on making a barrel of beer right where where you can make a pilsner i can make a pilsner for you know 16 gallons for about 110 bucks right and and an ipa would cost me almost double that yeah given the amount of hops and stuff you put into it so it's uh yeah, and you're just brewing kind of on like a 10 gallon 15 gallon scale where these guys are like, yeah a lot, a lot I, i'm i'm <laughs> i just recently added a, a a bigger pot to my to my collection i'm i'm capable i have a 50 gallon pot now and i can brew in the bag uh i can brew uh 35 gallons at a time so i can brew a barrel of beer like that's yeah, a barrel system a one barrel system so and we brew in a bag the way the aussies mm -hmm. uh, do so basically you know we steep our grains we circulate a little bit and then lift the grains out and then you know uh go from there because the thing is as a home brewer you know having a three pot system is really nice because it gives you a little bit more control on you know on efficiencies and stuff like that and and, and a little bit more predictability on your your efficiency and yeah. stuff like that but you know, you get used to your brew stuff, your brew in a bag stuff, and you can fine tune it that you know you you're in the range of where you want to be. You know, you're you you brew a beer, you want to be at the six point five percent. You come in at six point four six or six point seven four. It's in there. You know, I mean, yeah. Do you want to? I don't add water to make my numbers. I will sometimes add a little bit of corn sugar if I'm way off, like corn syrup. So, but I don't do that. Mostly on high output, high alcohol IPAs, I, I might do that. I might add, instead of adding DME, I've, I've tasted DME when I've done starters and it doesn't taste very good. So I add a fermentable sugar, corn syrup, and uh, boost to boost up the alcohol, but only when you <laughs> miscalculate it. And as a home brewer, you do miscalculate it. <laughs> uh, I mean, just the science alone is, um... Like I did the steam whistle tour five, six mm. years ago, and here's our quality control lab. And it's the size of a small office for just their quality control. And steam whistle at the po at that point was just their Pilsner yep. over and over and over. And there's a reason these guys are one of the most popular Pilsners across mm -hmm. Canada is because consistency. Yeah. And it's a very crushable beer. I personally love their new pale ale, uh, sitting down, super crushable, they're also, you know, they're a little bit above a microbrewery, but they're, mm -hmm. they're still, like, a super chill location to go to. And that's another, like, you want one of the best Pilsners in North America. Just there go you go. Them. It's right so. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Um, any tips for new homebrewers, people who want to start up? Kind of, like, mm. obviously stick with it, cleaning, but, but any other kind of tips that you would provide to those people? As I mentioned before, I think it's, you know, Find out if you if you enjoy actually if you oh, let's put it this way if you enjoy cooking and things like that you probably wouldn't have that much of a problem going in and starting up and yeah, you know what follow a recipe um, you might make mistakes here and there but if you know you, you learn as you go as long as you enjoy the process of doing it it's not a struggle oh, I got to brew beer today it's not a, it's not a job just treat it like a hobby if you don't like it drop it and I think the, one way to start out to see if you you like it is start small you know i mean start off with a five gallon bottle a uh, five gallon uh, pot brew in a bag is a is the quickest way just one pot and uh and try it and you know there's a, there's a ton of information on the internet to get you get you going see if you like it i, I know a lot of people start it and you know i get tired of it and in some ways it, it's a trade-off you know like we we're just talking about you can go anywhere and get a beer you like at a brewery down the street you know oh, i can go here i can pick up beer why am i making my own so there's that kind of trade-off too but i think it's more if you, you have that creativity you like to cook or you know you'll probably enjoy it and i'm not really a big cooker i like barbecuing so i don't know why that <laughs> i just like beer a lot i guess yeah. <laughs> yeah so the only thing i say is like basically is not not to get intimidated i know when i first started with drew at first when you're, you're really worried about the steps when to like Oh, I got to put these hops in at minus 30 and then you, the T minus and how to calculate backwards. And it's not complicated. It's intimidating for someone that's never done it. And there's lots of steps in making an IPA. 
because you have to introduce hops at different temperatures and at different times and throughout the brewing process. But uh, it, it, it's intimidating till you do it once or twice and then it's, it's so simple. It just comes natural after that. It's like when you're making, like when you make a cake for the first time, if you've never baked a cake before, obviously if you buy a Duncan Hines in a box, it's <laughs> gonna be a lot easier. But if you make it from scratch, obviously, you know, it's intimidating because, oh shoot, uh, the, my, my oven, 350? Yeah, uh, this is, uh, I gotta put, oh geez, a teaspoon? No, not a tablespoon, a teaspoon, <laughs> you know? Stuff like that, but if you, uh, that part is easy. And if you can hook up with somebody that home brews first, like I did, I cheated big time off of this guy. <laughs> I made every doubt. mistake in the book. Yeah, <laughs> and I and I was able to avoid those mistakes just by brewing with him. And we still make we mistakes. We still do. Oh, yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, and we still bounce stuff off, off each other. For sure. Did you try that? Like we've got, I've got a yeast that the Drews tried the, that I haven't tried yet. It's the Verdant Strand. It's a it's a strain. It's a, it's a dry yeast, and I've got to brew something with it. Yeah. But I have it in the fridge there. I'll use it sooner or later. But it's excellent. Yeah, it's it's. This is the other thing too, home brewing is, it's all there and the, this whole discussion about dry yeast versus uh, liquid yeast, right now I'm finding the dry yeast, like the verdant strain that they put together, you know what, if I'm stuck, oh I didn't make a starter, oh I have six hours today, I can brew a beer or whatever, it is. I can do an IPA or whatever I want to make. Verdant. I can, I can get up in the morning, start my water, crush the grains and I, at the end I don't have to worry about, oh I didn't have a yeast ready, you know. <laughs> so there's all that, all that flexibility just with that for example so it's uh it's pretty but cool you, you can make a pretty good beer uh, 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 just in your the, the the thrill of it after the fact is is you first tasting it and then sharing it with others that that yeah. is the thrill of seeing because ah, we yeah, can't drink you know, it all ourselves yeah anyway. Ooh, that, <laughs> you can try but there's <laughs> no, alcohol poisoning exactly yeah no, only so many bathrooms you can vomit yeah. in and stuff, but so. <laughs> but that's the key you can make you know somebody wants to start off making an ipa really easy use the dry yeast you can use the the verdant or you can use the lalman the new england ipa yeast it look it's not mm. like a it's not like a liquid yeast but they've come a long way they're they're good and you can make a good ipa with uh, three grains and two hops citra columbus yeah. Cascade, uh, stuff like that, you know, you can make an IPA really quick. Uh, yeah. You know. And if you want it for, if you want it really quick, just use Kavikis. Kavikis will give you grained glass six days. Yeah, you don't even need a starter with that. Just, you just take the, whatever size you're doing, just use uh, even half of it and can take care of it. Yeah. It take wow. ca takes care of the business very well. Yeah. So we brewed yeah. with the Kavik East, just the closing on that. We brewed with the Kavik East, and the problem with the Kavik East is they're great when they're fresh. As soon as they start getting out of that freshness range, I would say, you know, seven weeks, eight weeks old, then all of a sudden they start getting really orange zesty. But so if you want to switch to like a saison or a wheat, then you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what they is don't. This? They what don't... is it this week? Yeah. <laughs> Change the label. Oh, it's this now. Yeah, it gets very orangey. You know, at yeah. least it does here in in our kegs in the homebrew. And we've tried fermenting it. I've tried fermenting it as high as ninety degrees Fahrenheit and as low as ale temperatures like sixty eight and. Irregardless, I mean, yes, the one fermented at 90 is really impressive because it sort of boils inside the fermenter. You actually see it like I've never seen that before. I think I have a video of yeah, it. That, but that yeast goes wild at that temp, yeah, but it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, I have no other questions. This has been an awesome talk and I really appreciate it once again. Uh, if you have a social media or anything to promote or, or your own YouTube or anything, let the viewers know. No. I don't. I no, just... Just at some point, if you want to come over to the garage out in St. Lazar, more, you guys are more than welcome, for sure. Yeah, we'll definitely have to check that out. Personally, uh, we don't want to dox you. We don't want to have your information out there on the internet. So yeah. <laughs> let's uh, safety first, and because there's a few too many crazies out there on the internet yep. sometimes. Yeah. So. Uh, awesome. As for us, allbeerinside.com is the website, at allbeerinside on all social media. And as I say at the end of all episodes, drink craft, not crap.